we'll make sure that this makes it to our website and our uh, our YouTube page. Awesome. And uh, so kind of the way we're going to talk about things tonight, um, you know, I'm just going to kind of go over, you know, a little overview of, of the Grand Army of the Republic, a little bit of history about the GAR, and kind of um, the impact they had in Western Pennsylvania, and specifically in, in Allegheny County. Uh, and then Diane and John Eric are going to go into some detail about um, the Thomas Espy Post in Carnegie. So um, kind of to, to get us started, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with the GAR or the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, the VFW or the American, Re uh, American uh, Legion. Well, this is the predecessor to those organizations. Um, the GAR is going to be comprised of uh, Union veterans or U.S. Army veterans from the American Civil War. Um, and really this organization has started, um, you know, about a roughly a year after the war is over, um, you know, barely a year. Uh, in April of 1866, um, U.S. veterans are coming together, you know, whether that be Navy, Marines, or Army, and, um, you know, forming this fraternal organization. Um, real quick, I'm going to uh, read off to you. Um, some of the, the objectives of this organization, um, you know, first is to preserve and strengthen those kind and fraternal feelings which bind together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who untied to suppress the late rebellion and to perpetuate the memory and history of the dead. Two is to assist such former comrades in arms as need help and protection and to extend needful aid to the widows and orphans of those who have fallen. And three to maintain true allegiance to the United States of America based upon a paramount respect for and fidelity to the national constitution and laws, to discountenance whatever tends to weaken loyalty, incites to insurrection, treason, or rebellion, or in any manner impairs the efi efficiency and permanency of our free institutions, and to encourage the spread of universal liberty, equal rights, and just to, justice to all men. Um, so this is kind of part of the foundational document for the GAR. You kind of get an idea right there what they stand for. Um, and this organization is going to spread. You know, it starts in April of 66 in Indiana, um, started by a, a man by the name of Dr. Benjamin Stevenson. And from that point on, it's going to expand. You know, each state is going to have uh, its own department. For example, Pennsylvania is going to have a department that's established as early as 1867. And, you know, Picture every town, every city across the state of Pennsylvania uh, having several uh, of these, these GAR posts. Um, Allegheny County in particular um, is going to have uh, over 28 GAR posts uh, in the county. Um, and, you know, these vary. Uh, there's very, various places they will meet. Uh, for example, you know, for those of you who are in Pittsburgh or watching from Pittsburgh, I'm sure you've been to or have heard of or seen uh, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. Well, this is a, a structure that, um, you know, is kind of uh, founded by U.S. veterans from the Civil War, uh, finished in 1910. And not only is it a place where they're housing uh, artifacts related to the Civil War, but it's also a meeting place for these GAR veterans, uh, as well as the Thomas S.B. GAR Post 153 in Carnegie and Andrew uh, Carnegie Free Library Music Hall. Uh, which John Eric and Diane will talk about here in a little bit. So you're going to have all these posts across the city, um, you know, across the county, uh, rather. Uh, there's certain legacies that we still understand today. You know, I'm sure everyone watching has celebrated Memorial Day at some point or another. Um, that is, you know, originated to the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, you know, it originally started as Decoration Day is declared by the GAR commander, John A. Logan, uh, former uh, U.S. Army commander. And, you know, from 1868 onward, it's a, a national holiday that we're going to celebrate uh, that has uh, roots in the establishment of the Grand Army of the Republic. So even if you've never heard of this organization before, you have some kind of tie to it um, in your yearly life, at least. Um, you know, by 1890, uh, there's going to be approximately 500,000 uh, U.S. military veterans that are part of the GAR. Uh, and real quick, I want to just share uh, my screen here. 
So I'm going to show you all. I just said y'all. Um, <laughs> I've been in South Carolina too long. Um, I'm going to show you all real quick uh, a few um, kind of local photos and share a couple local stories here uh, related to the, this, this JR story. So there we go. Uh, for anybody who, who follows you know, Civil War Pittsburgh on Facebook, for example, you've definitely seen this image before. Um, this is our, our cover photo, and this is, I believe, in the collection at Allegheny Cemetery. This is an image uh, from Memorial Day, I believe, 1918. Uh, this is, you know, GAR veterans marching through the Butler Street Gate of Allegheny Cemetery. Um, you know, and, and these guys are, uh, you know, I believe they're from a, a local Lawrenceville Post. On the far left, there's a gentleman uh, kind of with a, a little goatee and his hat kind of pulled over his eyes. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Conrad Ahrensberg. Um, he's actually buried in Allegheny Cemetery, and uh, he is a veteran of Hampton's Battery. And I believe for a time he was uh, actually superintendent uh, at the cemetery. And uh, I believe that this Memorial Day celebration, or, or um, a commemoration rather, um, is something that's still kind of enacted to this day. Obviously, with the exception of, of 2020, it's one of the longest running Memorial Day parades in the nation. Um, I thought I'd throw this one in there since it's the SP Post, and I'm sure uh, Diane or John Eric will have this photo up there as well. Uh, but these are veterans um, from the from the uh, SP Post, um, and I believe am I wrong to say that there's some Garfield Post veterans in there as well? Nope, that's right. Uh, the guys that you see on the right with the white vests, those would be uh, Garfield Post from the West End. And I'll uh, I'll show you shortly here a couple of pictures of the uh, the building where the veterans of the James A. Garfield Post actually uh, met in Pittsburgh's West End, or what used to be called Temperanceville. Uh, but for anybody who's ever been to the uh, Carnegie Free Library in Carnegie, uh, this photo would have been taken on the very front steps of the library. It doesn't look too too different actually today. I just thought I'd throw this in there. Um, so, you know, one of the, the largest gatherings of Grand Army veterans in Pittsburgh was actually in 1894. It was the 28th uh, annual national encampment. So, you know, years after the Civil War is over, you know, a lot of major cities especially are going to have these grand, you know, uh, national encampments. Um, and, you know, they kind of take turns uh, each year. And, you know, this this was one of the largest gatherings uh, in the Pittsburgh area up until that point um, in 1894. Uh, you know, imagine, you know, almost um, pretty much every hotel is booked up in Pittsburgh with uh, U.S. Army or U.S. military veterans. Um, you know, people are opening up their homes to veterans that are traveling from afar. Uh, you know, there's actually some really interesting accounts of even a giant um, uh, lit up, I guess, electric GAR on Mount Washington. Um, and the, the inclines on the mountain are working overtime, shuttling these veterans and uh, onlookers up and down the mountain. So it's quite a spectacle at the time. You can find a lot of interesting accounts uh, from this, this, uh, this encampment that took place. And actually, I have some photos uh, of the parade. On the right-hand side there, you can see uh, U.S. Army veterans are marching down Federal Street in Pittsburgh's north side, or what used to be Allegheny City. Um, they're marching you know, toward the camera, but in the distance uh, would be the bridge that would be connecting Allegheny City to downtown Pittsburgh across the Allegheny River. And you kind of get an idea here how many people are just packing the streets you know, to watch these veterans who at this point, you know, uh, sadly, you're, you're having, you know, a generation of these guys starting to die off in the 1890s. Um, and, you know, moving forward, you're going to start to see some of these numbers dwindling. On the left hand side uh, is actually a photo from the Library of Congress. It's an unknown uh, African American veteran from the uh, John Patterson post in Pittsburgh's South Side. Um, it's a nice crisp image. Um, and you know, the, the Patterson post 
uh, was actually a post that was, you know, not segregated either, um, which, you know, kind of was the case across the, um, the Grand Army. Even though in Pittsburgh, you did have one uh, post, the Robert Gould Shaw Post 206, which was all African-American. Uh, you do see a lot of, uh, you know, it's named after Robert Shaw from the 54th Massachusetts. A lot of veterans from the 54th Mass and the 55th Massachusetts, as well as many United States Colored Troops veterans uh, in the Pittsburgh area as well. And then here's a, a couple other photos, actually, uh, from my personal collection from the 1894 gathering. Um, the one on the right-hand side, I believe, is actually, uh, I think it's Fifth Avenue downtown. And it's kind of interesting because you can see there's a, a giant arch in the middle that was erected. I think there's... I want to say there's three of these erected along the parade route uh, in 1894. I think this was on it was on September 11th. Um, and you can see if you look real close and squint, you can see there's three figures on top of that arch. You know, kind of representing the sailors, the Marines, and the soldiers of the U.S. military. Um, and it was you know this is something that was uh, really to be celebrated. Um, and you can see all these regimental or these, these um, I'm sorry, post colors that are being carried in the parade as well. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, I'm not quite sure where this was taken, but also uh, downtown Pittsburgh. And so uh, I mentioned the John Patterson post, that building where they met, or I guess one of the buildings they met still exists today. Uh, if you were to walk down East Carson Street for my fellow Pittsburghers, uh, you know, you might not notice it right away unless you're looking up at the top of the building where you can see a big cast iron G-A-R. Uh, this was taken, uh, I took this a few years ago. Um, and since then, I believe this building has been uh, turned into apartments. Thankfully, though, it still is preserved. It still exists. Um, there's actually a skate shop that's in the, the first floor. Um, but yeah, the, 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 uh, John Patterson Post would have met, uh, I believe, on the second floor on the late 19th century. And then also, uh, we were talking about the James A. Garfield, and I messed up. It's not Post 151. I apologize. Um, this is the post on Steuben Street in Pittsburgh's West End. It's an old Oddfellows Hall. Um, and so uh, I'm sure uh, John Eric can throw some more in about uh, the Garfield Post here in a bit, too, uh, since they work very closely with the Aspie Post. And just a, a couple of things I wanted to throw in, you know, related to the GAR story in Pittsburgh, you know, a lot of these uh, memorials, a lot of these monuments and structures that you might see in Allegheny County, like the Allegheny County Soldiers Monument, would not be possible without the efforts of the Grand Army of the Republic or, um, you know, satellite organizations such as, you know, women that support the uh, the Grand Army of the Republic uh, and, and erecting these excuse me, memorials and monuments uh, to the men of Allegheny County who died during the, the War of the Rebellion. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this structure before, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall Museum. So that is what I had to share here. Let me stop sharing. And, um, you know, like I mentioned, uh, kind of fitting into this this bigger picture of the Grand Army of, uh, of the Republic in Allegheny County, the Thomas uh, Thomas S B G A R Post 153, uh, you know, is in Carnegie is really I believe the most well preserved um, Grand Army of the Republic post in the nation to this day. Um, for anybody who's who's been there before, it's you know it's really a treasure, uh, especially you know if you can. Uh, Find the original photos, and I think uh, John Eric's going to show this here in a bit, uh, and compare them to, um, you know, the original posts from the, the early 20th century even. Uh, it looks spot on. Uh, they've done a really great work, a uh, great job with uh, preserving the post and uh, maintaining all of the artifacts that are in this post uh, shared by the veterans who belong to the post. So um, without further ado, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let, uh, you guys, uh, kind of talk, uh, about the Thomas S.P. Post and, uh, share what you have with us. Sure. Well, let me, um, let me share my screen here real quick. I've got a few photos that will go with Diane's part of the talk. Uh, let's see here. All right. Okay. 
the floor is yours, Diane. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks, Rich, for that nice introduction to the, the GAR. And um, you're right, it, it is one of the best uh, preserved. Um, there is a book that was published called Glorious Contentment. And uh, the author, well, his wife's from Pittsburgh, so he stopped by to see it. And, and he, he, when he wrote that book, he really researched and visited a lot of the GAR posts left in the country, and there's only about a handful. And to put that into perspective, you know, you mentioned 500,000 members. Um, there were over 7,000 posts na nationwide. So, you know, we're one of uh, only a handful. Um, the post was chartered in 1879, so it wasn't that long after the GAR uh, was formulated. And, you know, when I first learned that it started in the Midwest, I was surprised, but it took a while for it to spread east and west. Um, but it was given the number of 153 as uh, the charter members applied for an application to start a post. Um, 153 is kind of an early post for Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania had over 600 and some posts. Um, and the charter members uh, served with Thomas Espy. And um, there is picture Thomas Espy in his uh, militia uniform. He was the captain of the St. Clair Guards, uh, which was a local militia. And when President Lincoln called for volunteers, he volunteered his men and um, they uh, were inducted into you know, federal service as company H of the 62nd Pennsylvania uh, Volunteers. The, um, he was a rather wealthy gristmill merchant that lived in Upper St. Clair. So, uh, and we actually have his uh, militia um, ledger book and it has the names of all the uh, members of his militia. Um, in 1879, the town of Carnegie did not exist. There were two towns, uh, Chartiers and Mansfield, depending on which side of Chartiers Creek that you were on uh, and where the library is today, that was Mansfield. So they rented space uh, throughout the two towns of Chartiers and Mansfield and were in the process of abstracting the post minutes. So we're finding a lot of places where they did meet. But the picture that John, uh, that Rich showed of the veterans on the steps, that picture was actually taken in 1904, which was two years prior to their moving into the library building. So we know that, you know, as early as 1904, they were looking at the library. Um, I think they were well aware that it was a building of permanence and stature in the community. And so they did come up to talk to the Board of Trustees and ask to be given some space. And they officially moved into the building in uh, 1906. Um, the trustee agreement uh, with the post uh, called for us to take care of their artifacts, uh, their books, the weapons, the paintings uh, in perpetuity. And we didn't do a very good job. Um, it, the, the whole building had fallen into a state of disrepair. And when the last veteran died in 1938, or John Eric has found one in 1939 now, but the, the trustees pretty much locked up the room and, and it was forgotten about for over 50 years. And very often when we're giving tours, people are astonished to know that, that, that it was locked up and forgotten about and ask, you know, how can that happen? And the only, the only thing that I can say is that first of all, we were poor. <laughs> there was no money, <laughs> barely keeping the doors open for the library and the music hall, let alone the SB post. But it's not until you're further removed from a historic event that you truly understand and, the, the meaning of that event. And in 1938, there were still a lot of um, Civil War veterans alive, so it, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, the post uh, was named after Espy. Uh, a GAR post couldn't be named after anybody that was still living. 
And several of the men that are charter members served with ESPE, and that's why it's named after him. Uh, but it was rediscovered in the late 1980s, um, Civil War reenactment group, and it was sporadically opened uh, over the years, but it was in really bad shape. Um, yeah, that's how bad it looked. <laughs> this is what the room looked like when I started working at the library uh, in 2006. Um, the crown molding at the top uh, near the ceiling is plaster. And when plaster gets wet and the roof had been leaking for many years, uh, plaster dries and then it crumbles. And so a lot of the core badges um, sitting atop the crown molding there, uh, they were encased in glass. Uh, they had fallen down. And so the glass was cracked. Fortunately, um, these were handmade uh, core badges, and but none of those were really damaged, just the glass was broken. Um, on the picture on the right shows a solid wooden door. Uh, that door used to be a, a door with a glass window so that people could see inside. And when the trustees locked up the room, they put that solid wooden door on and padlocked it. Um, you'll notice in this uh, picture on the left, there are some plastic runners on the floor. Um, that rug was so dry rotted after 50 years. Uh, and there was no environmental controls in that room. You know, the heat wasn't controlled. Um, there was no air conditioning. Um, and it was so bad that we were afraid of people catching their shoe on the strands of rug that we put plastic runners down. Um, so um, the next slide shows the long, on the, on the left-hand side, the long uh, cabinet to the left of the chair was where the St. Clair Guards flag uh, hung and it was just in tatters. Um, we have it, it's in uh, storage, but um, we had to have a uh, replica made uh, for when we restored the room. And um, in the slide on the right, the corner cabinet there contained the, the dishes, the, di the, the cups and saucers and spoons and and dishes because they would they would meet and um, in a room adjacent to the SB post um, they would have their lunches so they had their whole um, little bread basket and meat platter and um, when we finally closed the room uh, for restoration I had to take everything out of the room and the dishes that that cat had about 50 years of coal dust in there uh, because this was before the day and age of, uh, of the steam heat. Um, in 2008, uh, we had a, a benefactor come forward and gave us money to restore the SB post. We're in, in the process right now, even still, of a capital campaign. We're trying to raise $1.25 million to match a $1.25 to 5 million grant that we're going to get. Um, but we always intended to restore the SB post, but it was scheduled for a later phase. And uh, he said, oh, no, you can't do that. Um, you have to be ready for the sesquicentennial that's coming up in 2011. So for President's Day of 2009, uh, many of you may know Ed Bars. Um, he was the Historian Emeritus for the National Park Service, um, author, great lecturer, wonderful historian. Um, he came and gave a lecture and we had uh, one final viewing of the, of the room and then um, the contractors moved in and it was closed for over a year uh, while they worked at restoring uh, the walls. So um, the next view, will show you what it looks like now. That's the room restored. Um, one of our biggest challenges was what color was the room? 
because you could see in the previous uh, slides, there was no paint left on that wall. We had no idea what color it was. And, you know, I, the, the SP Post veterans paid for the whole room to be furnished the way it is, to have all that cabinetry built, uh, the raised platforms for the officer's chairs, the adjutant and the quartermaster's desks. Um, so I figured it was going to be beige or white, uh, but they did a core sampling of the plaster and sent it out for analysis. And this is actually the color that it is. And it is a beautiful, warm, um, like peach shade. Um, I'm often asked, well, what color, what, what's the name of that color? And it doesn't have a name. Um, but I always tell people, well, that depends on whether your ancestors were Union or Confederate. If they were Union, we call it pumpkin pie. If they were Confederate, we call it um, sweet potato pie. <laughs> so, but it really is a very, very pretty shade of, of uh, peach. I've heard, um, what is it, pumpkin chiffon as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And on a bright sunny day, it, it's just, um, takes your breath away when you walk in there. And as you can see, the, the uh, crown molding was restored and uh, all the core badges are, um, have been repaired and they're, they're back up uh, on display. And the, the next slide um, shows the, we replaced the door. It now has a, a door with a, with a window so that you can see in. And um, this picture that Rich has shown and that John Eric's going to show you too, the, the veterans on the steps in 1904. That picture uh, was done by the Carnegie Elks. They had took the original, which is at the historical society, they had it blown up, matted and framed and um, gave it to the post uh, when they moved into the room. Um, there's a difference between the photo that's in the room and the one that was taken in 1904. In the meantime, members had joined the post and they were not included in that group picture on the steps in 1904. So they kind of photoshopped those people in. You can tell uh, that they placed heads uh, in the back there that actually weren't there. And in the upper right-hand corner, there was some women hanging out of the window. Uh, they were the ladies of the Carnegie Monday Club, and they had given the veterans lunch that Memorial Day that they gathered there. So we hope that you come to visit us. It's open every Saturday, uh, free of charge between 11 and 3. Um, or if you want to make an appointment to, to come, or you have people from out of town, they're not going to be there on the weekends, um, just give us a call and um, do come for a visit. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Uh, so next up, uh, John, Eric, you're going to share a couple stories with us. A uh, couple, couple um, specific stories about veterans uh, who are part of the Thomas SPGR post, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, and please feel, you know, anyone watching on Facebook, if you have any questions at any time, we're kind of following along. So feel free to uh, ask questions as we go. Um, I should mention though that all of that beautiful restoration work, um, everything that Diane just talked about, um, I had nothing to do with any of that. That was all done on Diane's watch. I am the uh, Johnny Come Lately uh, to the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall. Uh, I had worked there uh, many years ago uh, under, uh, under Diane as a graduate student um, and then uh, she had asked me last at the end of last year if I might like to uh, come back. And as a, uh, a diehard Cleveland Browns football fan, I'm only too happy to bring that good taste in sports teams back to the uh, South Hills of Pittsburgh. Um, but one of the honestly, though, um, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited about uh, coming back to the SB Post uh, was the stories that this post can tell. Um, you know, there are the stories of the artifacts um, and that can be, you know, we can illuminate those stories through uh, the catalog that we have here, the Veterans Created, uh, that tells us, uh, you know, a story about each of the artifacts, who it belonged to, where it was used, why it's significant. Um, but we also can tell the stories of the veterans themselves. 
Um, and you know, my personal interest in the Civil War is very much that of common soldier. Um, you know, if we estimate that somewhere around three million men participated in the Civil War in some fashion, that's North and South, um, that means there's about three million stories uh, that can be told. Uh, but when we throw out numbers like that, millions of people, uh, it's easy for those guys to seem baseless. Um, but each of those, each number there represents a, a real person who you know, lived and breathed and participated in the Civil War, someone that had a family, uh, you know, a, a mother, a wife, children. They had communities that were impacted by their involvement in the war. Um, so, you know, this photograph here that now all three of us have shown, um, that shows around, you know, 100 of those 3 million men. Um, these were veterans of the Captain Thomas Espy Post, primarily uh, more on the left of the photograph there. And then the guys that you see um, in the white vests, those would be from the sister post, uh, the uh, Garfield post that Richard mentioned in the West End of Pittsburgh. Um, both of those posts worked very closely together. They were often together for uh, Memorial Day or Decoration Day activities and for parades and whatnot. So there, there's a good relationship between the two posts there. But you'll notice, um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse as I kind of move it around here, but you'll notice several of the guys have umbrellas here. And you'll notice mud uh, on their pants. It was a rainy day as they were going out. Uh, so they got a little muddy there. Um, but, you know, there's lots of great places to find these stories. You know, there's the letters and the diaries uh, that these guys had recorded during the war. Um, there are their pensions, their regimental histories, their compiled service records. Uh, but one source that I think often, too often, gets overlooked uh, are the records of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, you know, Rich had talked about the origins of the GAR, um, but it really was kind of a great equalizer uh, among Civil War veterans. Uh, there were other organizations out there that were much more restrictive. Uh, you had groups that you had to have been in combat, or you had to have been wounded, uh, or you had to have been a prisoner of war in order to be a member. The Grand Army of the Republic wasn't concerned about any of that, whether you had served for four days or four years, uh, as long as you had served your country during the Civil War uh, and had been honorably discharged, uh, you were welcome. Um, so these were guys who were proud of their service. And, you know, I think we have a, a tendency sometimes to discount um, some Civil War soldiers or Civil War veterans. We think that, you know, oh, if, if they weren't at Gettysburg, if they weren't at the wilderness, then did they really do anything? Um, I can actually, I can remember several years ago at the Mansfield Civil War show, I had asked a dealer about a particular uh, soldier's photograph that I was interested in. And he kind of like scoffed and said, oh, that's a, that's a do nothing regiment. That made me, that made me kind of mad. Um, you know, a mini ball could kill a guy just the same uh, at some nondescript skirmish in Kentucky or in Florida, same as it could at Gettysburg. Um, you know, fever or disease could get you all the same in Louisiana or Missouri or any backwater of the war, just as it could, and, you know, hospital in uh, Washington, D.C. or Virginia. And some of my favorite regiments uh, of the Civil War would probably be considered these do-nothing regiments uh, by some. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should discount their stories. Um, these are some of my favorite stories from the SP Post. I think just recently on Facebook, or within the last month or so, I shared the story of one of the SP Post veterans, um, John Hosack, who was a member of an independent company, Tanner's Independent Company. Um, he literally never left Pittsburgh during his service. Um, but, you know, I, I like these kinds of stories because they're stories that people aren't telling or that haven't been told. Um, you know, with, with Gettysburg, it seems like everything has been exhausted. Um, but, you know, th these are good stories as well. So the Grand Army of the Republic didn't discriminate against these guys uh, based on their service, and I feel like we shouldn't either. Um, but what's remarkable about Captain Thomas S.P. Post is that it did survive, like Diane mentioned, as a virtual time capsule. Um, and visitors today can come in and they can see that with the, the artifacts as soon as they enter the room and the furniture, it's all still there. Uh, what visitors typically don't see are the literally thousands of pieces of paper um, that were preserved in the post room. And that's everything from applications and you know, bound meeting minutes down to literally just scrap 
scraps of paper, like receipts for, for coal and tobacco. Um, the GAR were great record keepers in their time, um, but they didn't have a really good system for what was supposed to happen uh, with these records when a post disbanded. Um, you know, there, there were some regulations that said when uh, a post was, uh, when a post shut down that they should be transferred to the department. But a lot of times these posts ended up as kind of one or two really old kind of decrepit veterans. Um, and these guys would simply close the books and walk away. Um, sometimes the last secretary of the uh, post would take the records home. I've run into that a few times. Um, but often, you know, if a post was meeting in rented space, the records end up being lost. Um, so, you know, there's quite a dearth of surviving Grand Army of the Republic records. When you consider that you know, there were more than 7,000 posts in existence, I think Pennsylvania had um, between 645 and 650 posts. Allegheny County had you know, 28 to 30 posts. Um, but in Allegheny County, particularly, we're lucky because of uh, soldiers and sailors. When so many posts were disbanded, the records were transferred to soldiers and sailors. Um, but there are still several local posts to the Pittsburgh area where their records are just MIA. We don't know where they've gone. Uh, so, you know, in speaking and in, in talking about the Grand Army, Army of the Republic records, one of my favorite resources, uh, are, they're called personal war sketch questionnaires. And these were pre-printed forms. Uh, they'd have a set list of questions that the veterans would answer about their service. And for the most part, these are general questions like, uh, what are your what were your dates of service? What was your rank? What battles you participated in? Uh, were you ever wounded? Were you ever in a hospital? Were you ever a prisoner of war? Um, this is all really great information. It's probably all stuff that we can pull together from you know various types of, of resources. Um, but here with these forms, it's all in one place, typically recorded in the veteran's hand uh, or in the hand of the post historian. Um, at the Captain Thomas SP post, we have, I think, around 40 of these. Um, they've all been scanned. They're all available on our website. They're all really great reading, and I'd encourage you to go check them out. Um, by comparison, Soldiers and Sailors has over 2,000 of these uh, personal war sketch questionnaires. Um, but these things are such a wealth of untapped information. And you know, your answers on these forms didn't determine uh, whether or not you were admitted to that particular GAR post for membership, you still had to make a formal application. Um, but these questionnaires were more just a means of recording your wartime experiences for posterity. And my favorite part of these forms is actually the questions at the very end. Um, these forms there, they ask the veterans, you know, who are your best friends in the service? Um, what do you deem your most important contribution to the war? Are there any other matters that you would like to record that you, know, you want to record here for posterity? Um, and I like these questions because with these, you kind of get away from the facts. You know, when you enlisted, what your rank was, those are facts that, like I said, we can confirm from other sources. Um, but with these questions, you get into how the soldiers felt, you know, their feelings after the passage of several decades. You get into how these guys wanted to be remembered. Um, so, you know, for the rest of my talk here, I pulled together just a sampling of some of these uh, personal war sketch questionnaires uh, to share with you from the Captain Thomas Espy post. Uh, and like I said, all of these are available on our website. I'm only sharing brief snippets of them. So you, I'd really encourage you to go on there uh, and read all of those yourselves. So, you know, one SP post veteran, Enoch Holland of the 9th Pennsylvania Reserves, uh, he was more boastful. Uh, when answering what his what he felt his most important service was, uh, when he answered shooting rebs, uh, being shot at and trying to keep from being hit. Um, you know, Holland was the, the 9th Pennsylvania Reserves, they were a hard fought regiment. Uh, Holland was in the battles of Malvern Hill, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, uh, many others, uh, and he escaped all of them without injury. So he did a pretty good job at not being hit. Um, but, you know, some of the kind of lost cause rhetoric that comes up after the Civil War would have you believe that you know, everything was rosy after the war, that everyone wanted to get back together and hold hands and put away hard feelings. That definitely wasn't always the case. So many of these guys had, you know, suffered for years. They'd watched their friends, their family members be killed in battle or die slowly of disease. There were still hard feelings north and south. 
so when Holland says that shooting Rebs is his most significant service, it sounds kind of crass or boastful, but we can probably take him at his word. Uh, that's what he remembered most or felt was his most significant contribution. But, um, you know, another common theme that runs through these forms are guys remembering food or hunger. Um, we take for granted today that we can eat essentially whatever we want, whenever we want. We have so many options. Uh, that wasn't a luxury that Civil War soldiers had. And it's interesting to see how these guys would remember that several decades uh, down the line. Uh, SP veteran George Wilhelm um, answered what he remembered most about the Civil War was commissary and hardtack. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, just, just the feeling of, of being hungry and wanting food and not being able to have it uh, when you wanted it, it's something that's probably st stuck with a lot of these guys. Um, Joseph Chalfont of the 6th U.S. Cavalry uh, recall, recalled that his most important contribution to the war was stealing chickens. And you can see a, a image there from uh, Hardtack and Coffee, the more well-known books published after the war of a soldier stealing chickens. Um, but you, know, you, you see accounts written during the war in letters home, uh, letters to newspapers or diaries where soldiers uh, think about uh, or talk about how much they miss the food from home, they miss home food cooking. Um, and then after the war in these forms, you see how um, these guys kind of probably never took food for granted again uh, after their service. Uh, James McGrogan, SB Post veteran, he was a private in the 62nd Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, he was severely wounded in the left leg at the Battle of Malvern Hill. That's July 1st, 1862. That anniversary is coming up in just a few days. Um, when his regiment retreated from the field, they could not remove their wounded. So he and the other men, wounded men of his company, uh, were left on the field. Uh, they were captured by Confederates, and McGrogan's leg was amputated by a Confederate surgeon. Um, McGrogan, in his form, recalled lying on the field for 15 days, during which time he wasn't given a drink of coffee, uh, and the only thing that he had to eat was some raw dough. Uh, he recalled maggots crawling all over his leg, uh, and he closed by saying, I could not describe the horrors we suffered for those 15 days, and I hope I shall never experience them again. I mean, now again, we, we can't really relate, but can you imagine? You're know, lying outside in the field, probably with little shade in the July sun in, in the Virginia, um, in the summer heat, you know, almost nothing to eat or drink, having maggots and flies crawling all over you. You know, we can't appreciate how traumatizing that must have been. Um, McGrogan actually would survive until 1907. Um, but this, this memory, I think, still haunted him uh, all those years later. Uh, William Snyder, another SP Post veteran, he had an entirely different kind of wound. Um, on Snyder's questionnaire, he recalled that the most significant event of his service uh, was while he was traveling on the railroad from Pittsburgh to Baltimore. Um, he was standing on top of the train car as it was getting ready to pass under a railroad bridge, an overpass, and he, he didn't realize that the bridge was coming up, uh, and he hit his head off the top of the bridge, and it left him senseless. So, you know, Snyder wrote on his form that even after the passage of several decades, he still suffered from that blow to the head every day. Um, he was only 17 years old. If you, you know, look at his headstone there, he was about 17 years old at the time he enlisted. He would later be captured by Confederate guerrillas in Tennessee, uh, but it was that blow to the head uh, that he remembered most and that would affect him for the rest of his life. Uh, Captain William McIntosh of the 63rd Pennsylvania recalled that his most significant uh, event was when he saved the colors of his regiment at the Battle of the Wilderness on May 5th, 1864. Uh, in just two days at the Wilderness, the 63rd Pennsylvania would lose think, around 186 men as killed, wounded, or missing in action. Um, on May 5th, the color bearer of the regiment had been killed, uh, and as the regiment was nearly surrounded, McIntosh uh, ran forward uh, and he grabbed the colors and he carried them to safety. So, you know, during the Civil War, a regiment's flag was so important to them. Uh, it, was, it was their identity, uh, represented home, their families, who they were. Um, so, you know, losing a flag was almost considered a humiliation or a stain. Uh, and McIntosh risked his life uh, to make sure that that wouldn't happen 
Uh, so you can see the flag here. That flag was actually retired uh, following the wilderness, and I believe it was uh, presented to uh, uh, General Hayes's family. Is that right, Rich? You might know that. Um, that I'm not sure about. Okay, well, they, I, I know this This flag was eventually it was retired in May 1864, and they got a new flag. The new flag was subsequently captured uh, just later that year at uh, Boyden Plank Road. I think it was October 27th. Uh, 1864. Um, but yeah, that's that was the flag that uh, Mikitosh carried from the field. Um, so finally, you know, the, the common theme that runs through these answers to these questionnaires is uh, patriotism. Uh, Reese Evans of the 110th Pennsylvania, he wouldn't enlist until April 1865. Uh, he waited until he was 18 years old. So by April 1865, the war is all but over. Um, but to him, what he said his most important contribution was, uh, was that he had offered his services to his country. He was very proud of that. Uh, William Chambers of the 80th Ohio said his most important contribution uh, was that he had saved his country. And then uh, SP Post veteran John Trimble of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry said that he was most proud that he was in the war, that he'd lived to see the end of it, and then he got to appreciate the glory of being uh, one who had helped to end a rebellion. Um, so these these guys knew that you know, no matter what they went on to do in the rest of their lives, um, the Civil War was the single most important event of their lives. Um, you know, there was a time after the war where the veterans weren't really appreciated. They were kind of seen as a drain on the national economy because how much was being paid out uh, to the veterans pensions and the widows pensions. Uh, but once you get into the 20th century, these guys are essentially uh, local celebrities. If you're going to have a parade, if you're going to have a bridge or a building dedication, uh, whatever you were doing, the veterans kind of had a spot of honor there. And these guys uh, reveled in that glory uh, that Trimble describes. Uh, so, you know, one final story with these forms. Um, William J. Glenn, he was captain of the 61st Pennsylvania, one of the good kind of hard fighting uh, local Western Pennsylvania regiments. If you think of any of the big battles, uh, the Eastern Theater, the 61st was probably there. Um, I don't know if Steve Fan is watching, but these guys were even at the Battle of Fort Stevens, July 1864. Um, Glenn was wounded a month later at the Battle of Charlestown in August 1864. But more than that wound, he recalled uh, the most important events of his service were the storming of Marie's Heights at Fredericksburg, in December 1862, and the march to Gettysburg, not the battle of Gettysburg, but the march to get there uh, when the Army of the Potomac is racing kind of hell for leather uh, up from Virginia to catch the Army of Northern Virginia and Pennsylvania. But I really liked that, uh, you know, how Glenn closed his application or his uh, questionnaire. Uh, he closed by saying, quote, I simply reverently thank God that I'm a survivor he was literally just happy to get out of this thing with his life. So, you know, I'd mentioned before, um, you know, Grand Army of the Republic posts can kind of, they were kind of scattered in some cases. Not everyone uh, is lucky to have the volume of records that we do or the soldiers and sailors has. Um, so you can find this stuff, you can find personal war sketch questionnaires uh, on eBay, you can find meeting minutes on eBay, or they show up at estate sales. You can find this stuff anywhere. So even you know, Rich has one of these uh, in his collection. So Rich, why don't you tell us a little bit about this guy? You got to unmute yourself. There we go. So um, this actually is framed and, and hanging right behind my head here. Uh, this sketch is actually from Jonas Walker, who was enlisted in uh, Company A, uh, the 101st Pennsylvania. Um, Jonas Walker, um, you know, is a young man born 1842 in Pittsburgh, so he's, you know, fairly young when he enlists. He, um, you know, is captured in uh, April of 1864, um, and uh, with, with much of his regiment, really. Uh, and he's going to be sent to Andersonville subsequently. Um, and for anybody who is, you know, a Civil War historian, Civil War buff, Civil War nerd, or just, you know, uh, has dabbled in history, you've probably heard of Andersonville. It's, you know, really the, arguably the, the ugliest um, prison camp that's established during the American Civil War. 
uh, a lot of veterans, you know, the, the guys who are going to be sent to Andersonville, it sticks with them the rest of their lives if they're lucky enough to survive their time at Andersonville. You know, John Eric was talking about, you know, some of these guys in the battlefield who are wounded, um, you know, in this, this, you know, summer heat in Virginia um, and being taken away to some faraway prison camp. Uh, a lot of the guys who were taken here to Andersonville, um, as I mentioned, are going to be lucky if they come out alive. Uh, living in these horrid conditions, it's going to be choked and, and overcrowded, uh, using the same water source for your food as well as your waste. Um, and that's where Walker is sent. Um, and afterward, um, he's actually going to be escorted. He's going to be sent uh, to, to Savannah and um, Charleston and, and Florence, South Carolina, all to different uh, Confederate prison camps. And this is something that really stuck with him uh, the rest of his life. I believe he actually mentions here um, on this sketch that, you know, one of the things he remembers somewhat toward uh, the end of the war uh, is being liberated by some of William Tecumseh Sherman's troops. Uh, he couldn't remember their names because he said he was so delirious and uh, had been, you know, starved uh, up until that point. But thankfully, he survives. He makes it back to Pittsburgh. Uh, and he's going to end up joining the um, GAR Post 162, which is the John B. Clark Post, uh, named after the commander of the 123rd Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, so this is kind of a good example of a, uh, you know, one of these historic sketches uh, completely filled out, you know, to the, the best of his memory. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, that's an image that I believe was uh, taken before his capture during the Civil War. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see as he would have looked uh, at the time he was uh, part of GAR Post 162. Uh, and he, he actually lived to a ripe old age. He passed away in 1928. So uh, thank you, John Eric, for sharing that one. Yeah, this is this one's really great. And you know, if you get on our website and you kind of scroll through uh, some of these forms, you can see you know where you know some of the guys who clearly had hard service. Um, they didn't fill out too much. Maybe they were you know, like today. You know, some veterans don't want to talk much about their service. Um, but you know, with uh, with Jonas Walker here, you know he's filling in the margins and he's making new lines. He doesn't want to leave anything out. Clearly, he's uh, he's very proud of his service and he wants to record that for posterity. But we 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 do have several like this as well. But it's interesting, kind of seeing the dynamics uh, between these veterans and what they would fill out, what they remembered, what they wanted to record. Um, not all of them were were proud or boastful. Uh, I think one of one guy. Uh, he, you know, even mentioned that uh, what, he, he hadn't participated in any battles and he didn't do anything that was of any account or so, you know, something like that. We we disagree with that, but uh, he didn't think that he, he did a whole lot. It's, it's um, interesting to note in there too, uh, you know, when they ask him, you know, what, uh, what do you deem the most important events in your service? He says, when we lay on Roanoke Island, Virginia and prison life. You know, obviously they would have been at Roanoke, I believe, after after the capture. And then, you know, the rest of the war from April 64 onward to the end of the war, he's going to be floating around prison camps. And that's really what stuck out to him. Uh, that's what, you know, he really felt was important to record uh, on this this record. Yeah. So, you know, where, where I've mentioned, you know, we have maybe 40 some of these questionnaires that were filled out by SP Post veterans. There were uh, over 200 veterans who belonged to the SP Post. Um, so that's over 200 stories that I feel like we should be telling. Um, so now when you come for a tour of the SP Post, you're going to hear stories, you know, you're going to hear some great stories about uh, some of the artifacts that are in the SP Post room, um, the veterans that were associated with them. I'm especially interested in the stories of those guys who you don't hear about. Um, so for example, uh, in the most recent issue of our Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall newsletter, Oh, I have an article about two specific veterans from the SP Post and Thomas E. Morgan uh, and Edward W. Powers. Um, so if you're on our mailing list, I think you'll be receiving or you may have already received uh, this copy of the newsletter. Uh, if not, you'll be able to find it on our website. Uh, and then you can also sign up to receive future newsletters. So I, I would encourage you uh, to do that. Um, but the article looks at how these two veterans in particular uh, wanted to 
tried to control um, how they were recognized, how they were remembered. Um, so Thomas Morgan here, he served in the 155th Pennsylvania. Um, he did not necessarily enlist for patriotic motives. Um, he had been arrested for stealing berries. Uh, he had a warrant out for his arrest and uh, the constable made him an offer. Uh, he said, you could enlist to serve in the Union Army or you can go to jail. So Morgan enlisted. Uh, he served for the remainder of the war with the 155th and then with the Veterans Reserve Corps. Um, I think in his, I, I think we have his uh, uh, personal war sketch questionnaire up on there on the website. And uh, he talks about being, um, uh, being there for conducting uh, prisoners of war from the battlefield at Gettysburg, I think down to Baltimore. Um, that was one of his events that he remembered. Um, but Thomas would go on to seemingly be the last surviving veteran of the SP post, and he got to enjoy all the celebrity that kind of went along with it. Uh, he's here, you know, shown here cutting the ribbon on the new bridge across uh, Chartier's Creek in Carnegie in 1930, I think 1934, yeah. Um, but when he died in 1936, you know, all the obituaries kind of refer to him as Colonel Morgan. Colonel Morgan died, you know, last rites of Colonel Morgan. Um, never mind that he didn't rise above the rank of private during the war. Um, a lot of these guys would kind of appropriate these honorary titles after the war. They wanted some control uh, over their legacy, even in death. Um, but, you know, Morgan was only the last survivor of the SP post, depending on what qualifiers you use. Um, Edward W. Powers was a veteran of the 84th Ohio, 171st Ohio. Originally, um, originally from Ohio, he had gone to school with William McKinley uh, growing up. Um, but you know, 84th Ohio, 171st Ohio, again, regiments that others might consider do nothing regiments. The 171st Ohio was a National Guard regiment that was specific, their, their specific purpose was for behind the scenes work. They were not supposed to be thrown into battle. Um, but Powers would end up being wounded in battle of Keller's Bridge, Kentucky uh, in July 1864. Uh, he would be captured by John Hunt Morgan's cavalry there. Um, but he would survive the war and after the war would move to Carnegie where he owned the house literally right next door to the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall. If you visit us today and stand in front of the library and look to your left, there's a white house. That was the Powers House. Um, he owned and superintended several coal mines in the Chartiers Valley area. Uh, and in 1889, he was charged with criminal negligence when one of his mines exploded and killed four of his coal miners uh, due to insufficient ventilation. Uh, Powers would eventually relocate back to Ohio and survived there until 1940, uh, which makes him officially, unofficially, the last surviving member of Captain Thomas S. P. Post. Clearly, his, his membership would have lapsed after moving to Ohio. Um, but you know, his death was big news in Ohio at the time. If you were to Google, you know, Edward W. Powers, Ohio Civil War veteran, you're going to find all of these obituaries, and I've shared a few of them here. Um, you know, published all over the state, his death would leave only around 200 veterans left living in Ohio in 1940. And Ohio was a state that had contributed, I think, around 320,000 men to the Civil War. And he would be one of the last 200 there. Um, what those obituaries don't mention is, is that Powers had essentially been run out of Carnegie, I think. Uh, he was taunted, he was harassed as a murderer because of that mine explosion. And so uh, I think he got out of town. Um, but you know, these are the kind of stories I'm interested in that I hope to flesh out uh, at the Captain Thomas SB Post. Uh, I'd encourage you to keep track of our Facebook page, our website, our newsletter uh, as we you know, turn out, as we do more research, dig into these records more, learn more about these guys. Uh, we'll, we'll always be sharing that information with you. Um, I'd absolutely encourage all of you to visit the Captain Thomas SB Post. Uh, like Diane mentioned, the building is celebrating, uh, the library is celebrating our 120th anniversary. Um, the SB Post is open for free guided tours, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. every Saturday. We also have the Abraham Lincoln Gallery uh, in the next room where we have very nearly every portrait or photograph taken of Abraham Lincoln during his lifetime. I think there are only a couple missing. Um, 
it's a really wonderful exhibit there. Uh, downstairs in the library, Diane put together one of the finest Civil War research collections you will find in any comparable public library of our size. Um, anything you could hope to find in that collection is there. Um, but really, I'd encourage everyone to come visit us, um, see what stories, what artifacts speak to you. Everyone has, uh, you know, a different artifact that they're moved by or intrigued by uh, on visiting the room. I always like to hear which, you know, what artifact speaks to you. So I'd encourage you to come out and, uh, and hear some of those stories and uh, find out some of this yourself. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Um, be happy to take any questions here. We'll give uh, Facebook a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Uh, anything else that you know, Rich or Diane would like to say? Let's see. Yeah, um, I'm seeing if we have any questions here on, on Facebook for us. Um, we don't yet, so uh, I do want to mention that, um, and I, I believe I might have mentioned it earlier, uh, we will be doing um, some more of these uh, kind of sparsely. Uh, you know, these chats talking about different Grand Army of the Republic posts in Allegheny County. Um, so, you know, anybody who is watching, uh, we will be announcing that probably later on, you know, whether it be on the Civil War Pittsburgh page or on the Captain Thomas SB Post page as well. Yeah, we, you know, just within the SB collection, like I mentioned, you know, the the SB Post did have a close relationship um, with Garfield Post, but we have, we, so we have, you know, definitely enough to talk about for the Garfield Post, um, the Post in Allegheny. We've got some good information there. There's lots of of good information that hasn't really been tapped into. Um, we, we've got a wealth of information in Pittsburgh and, you know, maybe we can arrange something with uh, Mike Krause, Soldiers and Sailors, to go check out some of their records as well. Um, but, you know, the, historically, the Grand Army of the Republic uh, has been kind of lost in translation. Uh, when we talk about the Civil War, we talk more about the battles and soldiers and, and not so much about how these guys lived the, the rest of their lives after the war. And there's, there's lots of good information there to share. So especially uh, for folks from the Pittsburgh area, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of good information. And now that, you know, things are, are kind of opening up too, I do encourage anybody who has the time, uh, you know, to visit these sites such as the SB Post or Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in particular. Um, and, you know, as we kind of do these programs in the future, we'll highlight some more. Uh, you know, if you feel like walking around, uh, walking outside of some abandoned buildings, uh, you know, such as the old, uh, I believe the Garfield Post building is abandoned. Um, you can kind of see where these, these veterans uh, met uh, in the post-war period as well. It doesn't look like uh, we have any questions in the chat. However, uh, if anybody's watching later on and would love uh, and would like to, to post in the comments section, uh, we'll be happy to address your questions later on as well. All right. Well, awesome. thanks we everyone for joining us. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Diane and John. John Eric. You're welcome. Good talking to you. It's great seeing you. Yeah. Take All care, right. Rich. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.